Hello and good afternoon, good evening, good morning, and a welcome to everyone to our panel looking ahead to 2099, what kind of world will the generation of our grandchildren and great grandchildren live in. I am very delighted to come today with three very exciting speakers like Rutger Breckmann from the Netherlands, Björn Thijs from Germany and Julia Watson from the United States. Also a very warm welcome to the three of you. Before we start, I would like to draw your attention as audience to the possibility of typing your possible questions to the panelists in the public YouTube chat, so they might find later an entry to our discussion. So, looking ahead to 2099, I would like to start with Rutger Breckmann. You are a historian, activist and author and your books, Humankind and Utopia for Realists have been both New York Times bestsellers and have been translated into 40 languages. You promote, amongst other ideas, the 15 hours week, a universal basic income, and in your latest book, the revival of the trust in humanity. And this is also where my question now leads to. In the short video shown before our discussion, a young adult, adult said when he was asked what kind of advice future generations might give to us retrospectively, he said, less hate, less war, more love. Hmm. I feel this comment has a lot to do with your latest book, Humankind, where you describe kindness, cooperation, and why not love, and understanding among human beings as an option, if not solution, for a better future. So um, is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whose traces you follow in your book, right, when he believes in humans' kindness? Hmm. I think, in a way, he was, actually. Um, there's a really old theory, an old idea, that's incredibly influential in Western culture, which says that our civilization is just a thin veneer, just a thin layer, and that below that lies raw human nature. You know, that deep down people are just selfish and nasty and, and you know, these vicious animals, basically. Um, one of the most influential proponents of that idea was the philosopher Thomas Hobbes in the 70th century who argued that, you know, in the state of nature, we lived lives that were nasty, brutish, and short. And you're right, at the, at the time, or actually around 100 years later, there was also a philosopher named Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a French philosopher, who's often dismissed as a naive, romantic, idealistic, you know, crazy Frenchman, who actually believed the opposite to be true, that human beings deep down have evolved to cooperate and to work together and to be friendly. Um, and the reason I wanted to write my last book, Humankind, is um, that there's really been a a silent revolution in science. So many scientists from so many different disciplines, anthropologists, archaeologists, sociologists, psychologists, you name it, have been moving from that quite cynical view of human nature to a much more hopeful view of human nature. Biologists are even talking about survival of the friendliest these days to describe our evolutionary history. So yes, it's a very different view of who we are as a species. And I think it has profound implications for uh, basically everything we do. That sounds quite optimistic. Thank you. So, Julia, let's talk about you. You are a designer and an expert in the field of low-tech design, a movement that strives to revive traditional ecological knowledge by collecting know-how, methods, and philosophy from different generations and cultures. In 2019, you published your book, Low-Tech, Design by Radical Indigenism, and you're regularly teaching at Harvard and Columbia University. So if the question of our panel today is what kind of world will the generation of our great grandchildren and grandchildren live in, it's impossible not to talk about climate change, today's climate sins, and the possible consequences for a very close future. In our previous talk that we had, you said the solution of this is an attitude. Could you tell us a bit more what you mean by this kind of attitude that you're looking for and how it can help us to shape the future and react to climate change? And maybe also talk about the attitude that the movement Low Tech you belong to wants to transmit. Yeah, um, I think it, there's a, a, a great segue um, from uh, what uh, uh, Rutger Bregman was just talking about that, you know, this this survival of the friendliest or I talk about this idea of not survival of the fittest, but survival of the most symbiotic. And, uh, you know, we came, I, I talk in the book about this idea of mythology of technology, and we have come through this lineage from the industrialization period that technology and 
uh, human relationship with the natural world is very separate. Um, we're superior to this world. We, we're masters over nature. And, and that's, that's the way we've been sort of evolving our cultural relationship with nature, the human nature relationship. But that really has to shift. And we're seeing that shift has to happen because climate change uh, has shown us that we have no control over that and that uh, we're, we're only allowed to respond. Um, and if we're going to respond in an intelligent way, we have to think about how those rep responses can become symbiotic. And we have a huge climate change movement happening, especially in the youth. Um, and I think what is missing from that, that um, movement is a belief system and a belief system that really evolves what's the cultural relationships between that human nature relationship. And so in my book, I look to indigenous cultures from around the world who create incredibly sophisticated, complex technologies that work with nature and the energetic relationships with nature. But I also look at the cultural understandings and the mythologies and the worldviews and the belief systems of those cultures. And I think that there's an incredible way that in the future we might be looking to inform a different type of cultural relationship that is about survival of the symbiotic working with nature survival of the friendliest that is in sort of informed by the thousands of different worldviews of indigenous and local cultures that really have lived with nature for hundreds and thousands of years have a deep knowledge of these and evolved knowledge of these relationships to inform the way we really think about those relationships into the future and and that's really sort of essentially what low tech is looking at is um, how do we how we take a broader perspective? How do we stop thinking that cultures from around the world that aren't the American European dominant culture and cultural understanding of progress? How, how are they sophisticated in other ways that we really understand is incredibly necessary at this moment under the conditions of climate change that we're experiencing and will be so important as we move into a future of trying to understand what are the solutions available? What are we missing in terms of our understandings of how humans can evolve, progress, live with nature and ecosystems and natural systems that are uh, complementary and evolving the current dominant model of progress, uh, evolution, economic um, and ecological relationships that we have uh, sort of presently constructed our world around. Yeah. So I see we have the survival of the most symbiotic, we have the survival of the friendliest, and now I'm curious <laughs> to, to know what Björn will expose to us. Uh, Björn, last but not least, I would like to, to talk to you. You are the head of foresight at Creavis, the strategic innovation unit and business incubator of Evonik, which is one of the world's largest companies for chemical supplies. You hold a master's degree in cultural anthropology, philosophy, and English, and you teach future research at various universities. And currently, you're working on the Foresight Project Sustainable Food Futures 2040. And now I have to admit that before our discussion and before knowing you, I was not aware of the existence of Foresight units in bigger companies. So it was very interesting for me to browse on Ivonic's website through the five different future scenarios that that you and your team have created in order that your company could react within five scenarios that have a lot to do with us um, as being humans in this world. For example, the scenario deceptive calm or the sustainable paradigm or the digital champion scenario. So could you kindly explore to us the making of and a bit of the content of these scenarios and maybe also confess which one is your favorite one? <laughs> I try, I try. But first of all, um, so there are corporate foresight units around, I would say, since the 70s. So, uh, so corporate started quite early with that, but the number is growing. And today there are many of these units established in many big companies. But back to your question about the scenarios. So the scenarios mentioned were our former project and was called the future of the specialty chemical industries 2040. And we understand scenarios with our applied methodology as yeah, consistent qualitative description of conceivable futures. So there's no wishful thinking, but we ask what can happen. And um, the, the, the uh, emphasis here is on the plural. So we have scenarios. We don't have one scenario and, uh, because we can't predict the future. That's uh, for sure. And 
uh, those explorative scenarios we developed, and not only my team, there were many, many people involved. It was the um, biggest scenario project I know so far on this topic. So we traveled to different world regions, included many voices, many disciplines from young to old, etc., externally, internally. Um, and we looked uh, and we did, did that with a so-called steep approach. I think that's also important to know that we just don't look at technology aspects, but with steep, the abbreviation stands for society, technology, economy, ecology, and politics. And with that holistic approach, we really try to include all aspects in creating those scenario. And the question of my favorite scenario, I guess it's quite easy to answer. Um, since if we look into our scenarios, you mentioned deceptive calm, let's start with that. It's obviously not my favorite. It's, a, it's more any, every scenario project has a status quo scenario. So how might the world look like if everything more or less progress as we know it? And um, if we do that, we see for the specialty chemical industry, the next decades, are not bad, right? We have a growing middle class, new markets, et cetera, et cetera. However, in that scenario, the search for solutions for the major global problems like climate change um, is a half-hearted effort. And then in the end of the scenarios, those negative consequences are becoming very, very serious, very costly, and very bad for societies all over the world. And obviously, you don't want to live in that world. And then we, the second one, we have the digital champion scenario where the big digital companies use their knowledge, their technology and their enormous resources to penetrate other sectors than IT. So they, as we know, they move in automotive, life science, maybe also in special chemicals. And here they capture significant parts of the added value, but also creating this whole digital ecosystems. You know, they are under discussion even today. Do you want such big players have their whole ecosystems where you, you are in or out? So it's also not my favorite. The next one, <laughs> turbulent times. And as here as the name suggests, even not my favorite, here we have a growing or we see a growing nationalism and that lead to deglobalization and um, then also to a decrease of solidarity. So it will be hard the survival of the friendlies. We will see that in that scenario. Hopefully, who's surviving at the end of such a future world? But in our this scenario, the world becomes multipolar, conflict loaded. I don't like such a uh, mm -hmm. future. Fourth scenario: Chinese dream. Regional scenario on um, just thinking about how might the world look like if China fulfills its long-term strategic plan made in China 2024 and becomes the first world's first eco-civilization. So it's not good, but still not my, my favorite. You mentioned the sustainability paradigm, a world in which sustainability is a guiding economic principle. Um, and processes, products, and business models um, are becoming it must be coming sustainable, but for economical reason, without waiting for governmental or uh, global regulation. And that mm. is my favorite here. Yeah, thank you, Björn. Uh, I think this leads very good to the, my next question, because uh, here we are three visionary thinkers, but watching the world and the future of the world from three very different angles and perspectives. So I would like to talk with you about your concepts of a good progress, because each of you deals with progress in your work. What is it for you? And what is the role of progress? And what are its boundaries, its limits? Maybe I would like to start with Rutger Breckmann. Um, in one of your books, you said, with, uh, without utopia, we are lost. But you warn, on the other hand, strongly of too much inhuman and uncontrolled progress. So how to advance <laughs> towards the future? So I think one of the most um, interesting questions you can ask as a historian or a philosopher or maybe as a, as a citizen is um, how will the historians of the future look at us, right? Because we can obviously look at the past and we can look at, say, the Romans or people who live in the Middle Ages and we can marvel at some of their achievements. Uh, but we're often also quite horrified by some of the things they did, right? Think about... Um, the gladiator fights or the witch hunts or, uh, you know, the inquisition, slavery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
And we like to think of ourselves as much more moral, right? As much more civilized than those who came before us. Um, but then the question is, how will the historians of the future look at us? Will they say, well, these people were already, you know, morally almost perfect, or will they be horrified by some of the things we do? Um, I think this is a valuable question because uh, it, it helps you to sort of think beyond um, what we naturally think about in standard politics or what's just on the news. Um, in one of my first books, uh, Utopia for Realists, uh, the, the central idea was that every milestone of civilization you know, whether you think about the end of slavery or democracy or equal rights for men and women, they're all dismissed as utopian fantasies at first, right? So it's, it's, it's now common sense, but common sense often starts as utopia. Um, and that process has always fascinated me. How does that happen? How do ideas that at first are dismissed as unreasonable and irresponsible and, you know, maybe even dangerous, how can they gradually become reality? And who are the people who who push that process, right? How does that work? Um, and what's, what's, what's interesting is that, you know, you, if, you, if you start studying that process, you, you become less and less interest, interested in sort of standard politics or, you know, the discussions on the news or whatever. And you become more and more interested um, in the people who are now in the margins who are, you know, dismissed as silly or, or idiots or unreasonable or whatever. Um, so, yeah, that's one of the things that I try to do in my work to push the boundaries a little bit mm. and to think from the perspective of the historians of the future. Yeah, I see. I don't know if Julia or Björn maybe would like to react to this and uh, explore a little bit about their idea of progress or maybe even utopia, because I guess in sustainability, we also need a lot of utopia, but also in the company universe, you also need new ideas, progress, utopias. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Julia, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I think for for low tech and, and the ideas that I'm thinking about, it's very much placed in the built environment and thinking about how do we change our built environments to be more sustainable without really just thinking about the limitations of going in two directions primarily, which are low tech, uh, high tech solutions, which really are available to uh, the global north or preservation areas, uh, areas that are already um, preserved, tracts of land, wetlands, forests. And that that's also particularly directed towards um, a sub subset of the world, the global north or um, more uh, uh, economically uh, sustainable uh, civilizations. And I think that this idea of citing low-tech or pre-existing climate solutions that are technologies that are not yet realized as technologies as a possibility to change the face of how we think about evolving our built environment and evolving the face of our world and thinking about progress really repositions uh, a large part of the world and about 70% of the population of the world within a space that means that they're not the most vulnerable, that there are technologies that are available to them, that they can contribute to the climate change solution on a global scale, that, um, that there is so much knowledge and a diversified knowledge about how do we change our world? How do we fight this climate change solution? How do we think about progress that is really based upon understanding these really close connections with nature and that, that you know, thinking about sustainability and, and where we go with that whole concept. You know, sustainability came from the great law of the Iroquois. And it was said that, you know, and it, that's an indigenous population here in the United States. It was said that when you think about decisions, uh, you think about them seven generations ahead of you. Yet sustainability is really used as a band-aid, especially in the built environment um, and the way we conceive of progress in our world that, we can do whatever we want as long as we have this band-aid of sustainability to 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 to, to slightly shift or 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 um, you know to to patch up or repair, but it doesn't really consider the general terms of sustainability, which is to think in really long timescales, to think multi-generationally, uh, to think about all the processes, and you know using a steep model, using a really complex model that understands all the ramifications. Um, of impacts at a systemic at a systemic level. And so I, I think that you know 
that sustainability can really be reconsidered with progress and and we need to we need to challenge that idea that we can sort of keep on going up higher and keep on going out wider and keep on going deeper to extract and then sustainability will save us but it's not going to serve us if we don't really systemically change the way by which we think of progress in light of the terms of sustainability mm -hmm. Thank you, Julia. I don't know, Björn, would you maybe like to add something yeah, from, the, sure, from sure. your point of view, being inside Evonik and also being an uh, anthropologist? And, and <laughs> Yeah, well, coming from a very nerdy company, of course, we believe in, in, in progress and improving life through technology. Um, but, but I think, however, we as a company as well, I think as every citizen on, of the world, we have to ask ourselves progress towards what goal. So progress for the sake of progress makes absolutely no sense. It's also useless to develop, uh, to develop technology just for the sake of technology or stick to old goals and roadmaps beside better knowledge. And, and that's uh, especially true in terms of sustainability. Um, therefore, I think, and we do that, it's really important to rediscuss on a, uh, um, your goals, your visions, your utopias, on a regular basis and 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 think about possible future pathways and we really have to to, to discuss and and um, on all different levels where we want to go with our progress so so what does that mean does it mean digging deeper to just mm -hmm. have the same products for the next hundred years or uh, is there more and i think uh, that's important and that's that's then we need also this kind of utopia for that um the problem is when we reach some kind of vision or utopia it's then it's common sense for me personally it's utopia i, uh, I can have a chip small as my fingernail and can carry around thousands of books that was an utopia every time when i was a child and went to holidays i couldn't have so much i want to pack so much books however now with sustainability we are close to I think even to, 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 to reach such utopias with cradle to cradle circularity approaches. But for that, we need a lot of innovation and we need also a, a, discuss, a, a huge broad discussion as said on many, many levels, what is our vision? What is our utopia till the year 2099 hmm, hmm. or 2050? And then we have the second one for the second half. Maybe that will work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe I would like to quote uh, Björn from one of our previous talks because uh, you were talking about the unevenness of the futures. Um, and coming back to our question, what kind of world will the gen next generations live in? And Julia was also talking about the global north. I, there might be still unevennesses, uh, but I don't know what you feel. If these unevennesses in the future, uh, Rutger, what I don't know what you would think if they disappear at some point, if they will be even deeper and much more visible than we have them in our days? Well, this is one of those things that future historians may be horrified, you know, by if they, if they, if they study the massive inequality that we have today. Obviously, we had the um, Occupy Wall Street movement. What is it now? 10 years ago or something like that. People who said we are the 99%. <laughs> and I was very sympathetic to that, even though at the same, th same time I was thinking, well, Actually, you're the one percent. You know, we in the West, we're the one percent. If you earn a median income in a country like the Netherlands, where I'm from, um, that's uh, that mean that means you're in the richest three point five percent of the world population, right? If you're on benefits, you're in the richest around what is it, eleven or twelve percent of the world population here in the Netherlands. So. Historically, globally, relatively speaking, you're you're already incredibly rich, and I I think that sometimes we forget in in what an unusual position we are, right? That it's um, we think of say um, the queen or the king of France, right, in the 16th or the 17th century, and we wonder how he could be so you know arrogant and narcissistic and selfish when the people around him were suffering and were hungry, etc., while he was just having a, a great time. And, you know, having all the pleasures of life. Um, but the historians of the future may say, well, actually, morally, people, that, you know, in rich countries in the beginning of the 21st century were in a similar moral position, right? It's just that they were blind to it. So um, I, I obviously have no idea uh, what the future is going to be like. I mean, we historians have difficulty understanding the past. So 
please don't ask <laughs> us about the future. Um, <laughs> That's but, the title of our book. <laughs> <laughs> but at least don't, tell, don't ask us to predict anything, right? I, I guess the, one of the main lessons of, of history is that things can be different, that there's nothing inevitable about the way we structured our society and economy right now. It can, it can all change, right? Um, and that's why I think history is also the most subversive of all the social sciences, right? It just um, opens up the mind, right? And it makes you realize that actually we can sometimes propose much more radical ideas that may may actually make sense. But, you know, it's it's not necessary. Progress is not some historical necessity. Uh, we were talking about the role of technology. If you look at the way we treat animals today, uh, I think you could see that as one of the greatest atrocities in human history uh, that is very much enabled by technology, right? We couldn't do it without antibiotics, you know, without the whole surveillance systems we have in factory farms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's, that's only been possible for a couple of decades right now. It's not the case, I think, that farmers today are more cruel than 100 years ago or 500 years ago. Not at all. It's just that they have this incredibly powerful technology. And um, our appetite is just, <laughs> you know, very big as we, as we get richer. And therefore, you know, billions and billions of animals get slaughtered every year. Uh, and at the same time, scientists discovered that these animals are actually much more like us than we like to believe, right? Uh, have feelings of empathy, have their personalities, have the ability to feel pain, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is a clear case where technology has not brought progress, but actually has brought us, um, you know, some, some horrible things. And um, again, this is something that when we think about the historians of the future, it wouldn't surprise me if they would see this as one of the greatest atrocities of our time. Hmm. Yeah. I think on the flip side that, of that, though, that, you know, um, we have a huge movement in the last hundred years to conserve animals as well and, and mm. conserve biodiversity. And, and, and everyone talks about, you know, this century as being the century when we'll be remembered for the greatest loss of biodiversity on the earth, you know, the sixth great extinction that's occurring now. And, you know, what I always talk about is that I, if I was to imagine the future and be a historian in the future, uh, I might say that this, cent this century won't be only remembered as the century when we lost incredible amounts of biodiversity. It's a century when we lost incredible amounts of technology that we didn't even yet realize was technology because it was embedded in our natural system and our landscapes. And also it was technology that was evolved by peoples that we didn't really consider as progressive. Uh, we thought of them as primitive and we thought of those technologies as primitive and those because those technologies are based in natural systems and working really closely with nature and human relationships that aren't considered as sophisticated when we think about technology in its current terms of technology. And the interesting thing about that is it's actually those technologies that are embedded in these natural systems and these places that are often the technologies that are conserving the biodiversity. And so as we lose the technologies, we're losing the biodiversity. So the current system or the, what we might consider the technology to preserve biodiversity on earth, to preserve animals is conservation is failing. Yet we're progressing the types of systems that actually are progressing biodiversity failure because we don't we don't preserve the technologies that hold biodiversity in place on this earth, which is the, the technology, nature-based technologies of indigenous and local communities. Could you give yeah. an example of one of those technologies, Julia? I'm just curious. Um, so one of the technologies from the book is, that is most relevant in a, in a context of a large scale city, there's a wastewater aquaculture treatment plant that sits on the outskirt of the city of Calcutta and Calcutta is a city, city of uh, uh, 40 million people. It, it actually, uh, process, 40 million people, it processes half the sewage coming out of that city every single day through a process of completely natural treatment, no chemicals, no electricity. It's a process by which sunlight and symbiosis and, and algae actually uh, change the system. And it takes about 30 days. It involves lots of different species, fish. It involves... Uh, algae microbiological treatment systems it produces food it produces a hundred thousand jobs for the city it produces irrigation water it reduces transportation costs because you're not growing food outside the city and bringing it in and it cleans the water that's coming out of the city in a city that is incredible waterways are incredibly polluted and that doesn't have a sewage treatment plant servicing the core of that city um and it's 
a cooperative of farmers that are fourth generation farmers that have evolved this aquaculture system that is incredibly That's... robust and, and ecologically complex. And so those that types sounds of systems. optimistic yeah that sounds yeah. good <laughs> thank why you for sharing that? this with us and we also have some questions from the audience um but maybe Bjorn, if you want to say something please and then uh, yeah, i would uh, like to switch over to some questions from the audience uh, just one uh, so I, one question one comment uh why is the technology uh why do you fear that we will lose such technologies because i mean there's huge interest right now especially in such zero emission systems or whatever you call it, especially in aquaculture. Yeah, I mean, indigenous peoples being removed from their lands and, and local peoples mm, being okay, removed so. from their lands is just a natural process. Even that particular uh, technology, which is incredibly resilient, it's it's about $21 million in savings for the, for the city of Calcutta that these farmers don't get any repatriation for. That system is being pushed out and developed because uh, the government is selling off land and filling it in because they can get taxes off land. Okay, so I all see, these yeah. systems are compromised by the economic frameworks of the dominant cultures in which they exist and which don't really value them as technologies yet, it, except we have proof that they are incredibly sophisticated and they mm -hmm. do have these quantitative numbers that show us that they have this multiplier effect on ecology, economy, um, infrastructure, and, and biodiversity. Quite I will keep this discussion in mind for our last question towards the end, but now I would like to read out uh, one or two or maybe two or three possible questions from the audience from the public YouTube chat. And one question is uh, somebody would like to ask um, if um, the panel, how reliable such visions of the future can be? And doesn't, for example, the pandemic, the Corona pandemic show us that we cannot foresee some developments at all? Yeah, yeah. Tell um, us. <laughs> uh, yeah, we in the case of 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 of, of uh, the pandemic, um, I like to talk, and it, it, I, it was a quote. Um, I don't. Uh, that was not a black swan. It was not expectable. It was a black uh, elephant. We knew that mm -hmm. the next pandemic is around the corner. So. Um, and, and um, we even, uh, my team even published in 2016 a report where we really said pre-prepared for the next pandemic. And that was not based because we have uh, some crystal ball somewhere because it was on a paper which was uh, published to the German uh, government also, I think in 2014. So that was not really an unexpected event. That was statistically, we knew that will happen so that 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 is easy and uh a second uh, thing to answer is uh, maybe how can we for, um, foresee so normally foresight or my discipline is looking 10 to 20 years ahead and um as said we are not predicting the future following few but following future pathways and just to give you uh, an easy picture we can just uh, one method is to follow the money if we see that there are huge investment in new technology in, in very much in many many nations we see that here is a big future bet, and then you can describe that. Hmm, I hope I see, that yeah. answered it briefly. I, I hope so. I cannot talk to the person, but <laughs> yeah, for me, right. it was answered. Um, Rutger, may I also one, ask you one question that came from the public YouTube chat? Mm -hmm. uh, you wrote uh, in one of your books that borders are probably the biggest injustice of, the, of our time. So do you think, uh, will the children of the year 2099 uh, still know borders only as a word, or will they know borders as a word, or um, may they just heard about it as uh, in a history class, or will there still be mm. borders? What do you predict you don't want to predict but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you foresee well again i have no idea um <laughs> but what i can say is that <laughs> borders are a quite recent invention right but few people know that you know at the end of the 19th century it was very, very fairly easy to travel around and most people didn't even own a passport um there were some countries that issued passports such as the ottoman empire and russia but these were considered backwards. And so many people actually believe that the future was going to be basically borderless. Now, obviously, that very much changed in the 20th century, uh, you know, since the First World War and the Second World War. Um, but it, it's, again, I think, um, good to remember that it doesn't have to be this way. This whole system, this global system that we have constructed over, over decades, it's, it's been made by people and people can change mm -hmm. it. Now, obviously, it's incredibly difficult when we talk about borders. Um, 
And sometimes people find it very hard to forget that their nation state that they love so much is actually a very recent invention, you know, and their whole national culture and their national anthem, etc. They don't have a, have a long history. But again, if you zoom out a little bit, then, then these things can become clearer. And um, yeah, if, if we look at the moral side of it all, yes, uh, borders are, are, you know, the cause of one of the biggest injustices of our time. Around 60 to 70% of your income is dependent on, you know, the fact where you were born, right? So I always say, if you want to be successful, choose your parents wisely, right? It's, that's the most important thing. It's the most important piece of career advice that you can give to kids. Um, but we live in this illusion that we call a meritocracy, right? Where, I don't know, you, what you earn or what you get is, is what you deserve or something like that. Well, obviously, if you just look at some of the structural factors, as I said, 60 to 70% of your income is dependent on the place where you were born, then another 10% on gender, another 10% whether you're white or person of color, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yes, um, so there's there's a huge amount of, of what you could, could call historically rooted privilege that that people don't like to see um, and maybe yeah i'm com coming back again and again to this point but maybe the historians of the future will will find it easier to see that yeah so listening to this interesting talk and to your proposals for a few for the future um and knowing that you all have a strong influence with what you're doing and proposing on how to shape our society's future let it be talking to top managers or let it be talking on the world economic forum at davos like rutger did or also um consulting lots of hundreds of companies in questions of sustainability uh, what julia does i i was wondering do people politicians managers companies listen to your advices and do they react on what you're proposing? I mean, do you really feel that you and other innovators can make a difference for a better future? Who goes first? <laughs> I can start. Um, so it was not always easy, but yes, I can answer that question, at least for my company in, in that sense. And, and it's not that they are listening maybe to our advice, but they are listening to our arguments and our work and our data we gathered and and and, and so and 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 if they if your argumentation is clear then you see that then if you, uh, then they follow and and then then apply our scenarios for instance to find out what how do we get a, a good future for the company so the mm -hmm. short answer yes they do yeah that's good because yeah. I mean, I'm also asking this because lots of uh, younger people don't feel that they have a voice or that voices like yours are heard inside society. Julia, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I mean, I am I'm definitely an optimist and, and definitely hopeful and, and the work that I've been doing really, it's picked up so much uh, since the pandemic because I think a lot of um, uh, governments, uh, companies, the, the people that I consult, they saw a real problem with globalization and the impact of the pandemic on globalization, especially on industry and manufacturing and, and the fact that globalization means all, there's such an interconnectedness of everything. Um, and when the pandemic really impacted that, uh, they had to sort of go towards a sort of multipolar um, world and there has been that shift occurring. Um, and I think, you know, that, they really essentially have started to understand that there's an incredible risk involved in ignoring um, climate change and 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 what will occur if, if that continues. And they see that, you know, in terms of supply chains and in terms of um, impacts of, uh, you know, cycles. And there's an incredible interest in, in this idea of introducing symbiosis into processes and and i actually think that you know multipolarity as as bjorn was talking about and sustainability in the context of regionality and climate change is really incredibly important and i think that they actually kind of for me they go hand in hand and it really yeah. in a way um uh, it, it really reinforces the work that i'm doing in that climate change and climate impact uh, and accountability really only happens on that regional scale um, and you have to understand your outputs and the effects uh, to really change and, and to really sort of change your inputs and understand that cyclical effect. And so the regional condition that the world is changing to in response to um, the, the instability that, that, that COVID and climate change will bring about actually is good 
uh, for sustainability and 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 really um, could have a is having a positive impact on people uh, being more responsible um, for their ecosystems for for the the shed in which they get their water the, in which they sort of produce their waste and impact um, their environments and so I you know I think the technologies that I talk about in low tech they're they might not be predictive just going back to the last question but they are adaptive and that's the type of technologies that we need they're born out of scarcity they're born out of understanding your local resources they're born out of understanding your local environments and conditions therefore they are the most sustainable and and that's the type of way we need to think about um progress and and you know think about how sustainability evolves hmm. Let me please uh, take one last question also from the audience, which seems quite interesting to me. Um, and uh, somebody wrote or asked, what needs to be done in addition to innovation to have a 2099 worth living? So what are the big challenges for a, for a good life in 2040 or 2099? Picking the right utopias, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so. Picking the right parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I can say uh, something about this. Kind yes, of please, please go ahead. Um, what I've often found interesting is that we find it easier to imagine, you know, fancy new technologies than um, the implementation of, you know, certain social values, right? We find it easier to sort of think about change in a technological way than in a social way. So, uh, a lot of people think, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go to Mars and establish a colony there. And for, for a lot of people, that, that seems to be easier than eradicating poverty or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, eradicating poverty is, I mean, technically, it's incredibly difficult. It's really, really difficult. You know, what is poverty? It's a lack of money. How do you solve a lack of money? Well, you give people money. That's it. Um, how, how much money do you need? Well, not a lot, actually. If you do it with uh, something that we call a guaranteed basic income. You build a, an income floor, like a floor in the income distribution. It costs around one to maybe 3% of GDP in, in rich countries. So it's really easy. It's really doable. There have been experiments around the globe now with basic income can do it. But when, when you talk to people about something like that, a scheme to abolish poverty, they're like, oh, that's never going to happen, right? The poor will always be with us. That's, that's unachievable. Let's go to Mars first, right? And that's, that's often surprised me is that that so often we have such a limited, um, I don't know, conception of the, of the possible when it comes to these things, even mm -hmm. though we have the means, we have the tools, mm -hmm. we have the research, we could easily do it. But yeah, we, we falsely tell ourselves, we, we convince ourselves that, that it is impossible when in fact mm -hmm. it isn't. Yeah, maybe that's a good moment to invite the audience. Uh, after this discussion, we also have a Q&A session with Rutger, Rutger Breckmann, like five minutes after this discussion. So I all invite you to this other event. So one last question from my side, because we are already at the end. I'm sorry, it has been very interesting. Maybe in one sentence. Um, Julia, maybe I start with you because you said already, I'm optimistic. My question would be, in fact, uh, this. So what is your... Um, yeah, what is your opinion towards the future? Is there a certain optimism or is there more like pessimism? Do you think uh, when futures, when future generations will look towards us, they will think they failed or what the hell did they do? What kind of world did they leave to us? Or are you still positive? No, I, I, I think or I hope that, you know, in terms of the book, I hope that one day this book will be one of the most incredibly banal uh, books that was ever published in that people would open it and say oh of course this is what my world looks like this is this is the where I exist right now and this was this was innovative this was future thinking this because it's it's interesting that it's a book that looks to what would you say past technologies and thousands of years worth of understanding mm. to imagine a future and I and I do think sort of one sentence that we often look to the future and forget to look to the past because we have this fascination with the future. Yet I think we, we really need to consider exactly what Uka was saying, like we have so much here that's available and, and we just need to uh, really think about what is, the, what is the, the global knowledge that can contribute to that new future rather than just one strand of that, that knowledge. That gives me hope. Thanks for this optimistic comment. So Björn, in one sentence, optimistic, pessimistic. Um, 
as a futurist, I think that optimism comes with my trade. And if you look at indicators like child mortality, global hunger, or access to education, we see a lot of progress in the last decade. So yes, I am an optimist. And Rutger, <laughs> you have the last word. Well, I'm a possibilist. <laughs> I believe that things <laughs> can be different. <laughs> Thanks for this word creation. Thank you to everybody of you for this wonderful discussion, for the interesting insights into your work, your thoughts, your world. And yeah, let's stay positive. And I invite all of you to uh, the audience to stay uh, tuned and then follow the Q&A session with Rutger Breckmann. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Björn. Thank you, Rutger. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye-bye.